Greetings, um, I'm Dr. Vesna Garovic, the Section Editor for Women's Health and Medicine of Sex Differences Mayo Clinic Proceedings. I'm delighted to welcome you to another in our online interview series, Pioneers and Legends in Medicine. I am especially honored to introduce as our featured guest, Dr. Nanette Wenger. Dr. Wenger is an Emeritus Professor of Medicine, Cardiology, Emory University School of Medicine, Director, Cardiac Clinics, Grady Memorial Hospital, and Founding Consultant, Emory Women's Heart Center. Dr. Wenger received her MD degree from Harvard Medical School in 1954 and her fellowship training in cardiology at Emory University, where she was then appointed to the staff in 1959. Dr. Wenger's first publication was in 1958, and over the past 60 years, Dr. Wenger has authored or co-authored most remarkable 1,644 publications. In her truly legendary career, Dr. Wenger has pioneered novel concepts and discoveries in cardiology, which have stood the test of time, central to which is the way in which Dr. Wenger revolutionized the field of cardiovascular disease in women. Until Dr. Wenger's work appeared, heart disease was conventionally viewed as almost exclusively affecting men. Dr. Wenger uncovered heart disease as a major cause for morbidity and mortality in women, delineated the myriad ways, both typical and atypical, in which such disease may manifest itself and delineated the risk factors that underpin um, its occurrence in women. Based on her novel insights, Dr. Wenger called attention to and emphasized therapeutic strategies targeting this cause of mortality in women, ones that proved sufficiently successful, such as that by 2013 to 2014, fewer women rather than more women before 2013, as compared with men, died from cardiovascular disease. In essence, Dr. Wenger discovered the disease in women and broadly facilitated initiatives that in reduced its attendant mortality. Dr. Wenger's contributions in this and other areas of cardiology are recognized worldwide, and indeed, Dr. Wenger is the recipient of uh, innumerable awards in her career, including citation in Time Magazine's Women of the Year issue in 1976, the Women in Science President Award in 1993 from the American Medical Women's Association, Physician of the Year Award American Heart Association in 1998, Gold Heart Award American Heart Association in 2004, Woman of the Year Georgia Commission on Women 2010, and Spirit of the Heart Legacy Award Association of Black Cardiologists in 2017. Dr. Wenger has served or currently serves in major leadership positions in numerous national and international organizations, including the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, the World Heart Foundation, the NHLBI at the NIH, and the World Health Organization. Dr. Wenger, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, I wonder if I may begin by exploring with you uh, your decision to go to medical school in 1950. At the time, there were relatively few women pursuing um, uh, this career, and I believe that your class at Harvard was just the sixth at Harvard to include female students. Well, you know, uh, we have a history of women in medicine in my family. My father's sister was a surgeon in Europe and many of my cousins were in medicine, uh, none of them women, but there was just never a concern in my family that there were men's careers versus women's careers, and I was interested in science, and my parents encouraged me. You know, it, it's interesting that in this regard, two of our three daughters are physicians, and when people ask them, what is it like to be a woman physician, they have the pleasure of saying they're the third generation women physicians in our family. Oh, that's remarkable. But uh, Harvard was interesting because Harvard was a bit late in admitting women uh, after many, many of the other medical schools. And in their ultimate wisdom, the Board of Overseers of Harvard said that the women would be in the Harvard Medical School on probation for 10 years. 
so that we were removed from probation, the EMI class graduated, and put into the university charter. But because we were on probation, we didn't receive university housing the way the men did. The men lived in the dormitory, and the women lived in apartments in town. <laughs> very different. Very, very different, very different. From Harvard, you went to Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, and then uh, south to Emory University. What led to these uh, institutional uh, choices and career changes? Well, remember, at that time, Mount Sinai Hospital was just a hospital. There was no medical school. So that all of the teaching and training went to the house staff. And uh, there were just the greats of American medicine at Mount Sinai in all of the specialties. Dr. Arthur Master was the retiring chief of cardiology. My chief when I started cardiology fellowship was Dr. Charles Friedberg. Dr. Simon Dack was there. It was just the great time and the teaching and training was fantastic. My relocation to Emory was a personal decision. Uh, I became engaged and my husband accepted an appointment at the Emory University School of Medicine, which was just beginning a full-time faculty. So that my husband went there as Chief of Gastroenterology at the VA and Assistant Chief of Medicine, and I went from being a fellow in cardiology to being Chief of the Clinics. So uh, it was a wonderful experience because our Chief of Medicine, Dr. Willis Hurst, had one concept, and that was the quest of excellence. And he was going to build this small southern school into a major teaching power, which it is today. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he allowed us to do so many experimental and unusual things in terms of medical education. And it was a very exciting period. It was an exciting period professionally, and it was an exciting period politically and socially. Because coming from the North, I came to a strictly segregated South and strictly segregated hospital. And over the first decade, and I am very proud to have been part of this change, watched integration of the city and of the medical care system. How, how fascinating this is really. Yeah. These must be really, really uh, times that uh, not only uh, allow you to participate into these changes, but really sort of uh, label your career and... Um, well, well, you know, uh, as chief of the clinic, I had a bit of autonomy. Mm -hmm. And in the clinic, obviously, they're strictly segregated. They were white and black waiting rooms. Uh, the charts were numbered W for white and C for colored. So it was a totally separate system, totally separate blood banks. It was a criminal offense in the South to cross transfuse blood. So it was, it was something that I'd never been exposed to. And in the clinics, routinely, the white patients were called Mr. or Mrs. and the black patients were called by their first name. And I just said, this is not acceptable. This is not gonna be done in this clinic and it changed the next morning. There was a little bit of fuss and a little bit of bother, but that stayed. And we did another number of things. Remember, this is a charity hospital. It is the care for the most vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And people inappropriately made the assumption that being poor and being not smart were concomitants. And I was not ready to accept this. Patients at the hospital, when they went to the pharmacy to get a prescription, got their prescription by numbers. They got a 3, a 5, a 24, and they had no idea what it was. And we started the beginning of medical education in the clinic. We said number one was digitalis. This is your heart pill. Number, and we, and they, they were just small education. And then I worked with the pharmacy and I said, this is not acceptable. You have to put the name of the medicine and what it's for. And it took about four years, but that happened as well. But we started the education telling them what this was, giving it a name, and essentially saying what they were taking these tablets for. 
So it, it seems that then it almost came naturally to you to question another dogma, which is that cardiovascular disease is predominantly occurring in men. Well, I saw women patients in my clinic. I saw women patients on the hospital wards who had coronary disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I went to the literature to see what was the information about treating them, there was nothing there. And the presumption was that whatever was effective in men could be used for women. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a leap of faith that was probably unwarranted and began to question what we should do. I brought the issue to the American Heart Association, to the American College of Cardiology, and I really got a good audience at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute so that I was invited to chair a workshop and then subsequently to chair the conference on heart disease in women for the NHLBI. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, because the conference proceedings were published in the New England Journal of Medicine, this brought the whole concept of coronary heart disease in women to the forefront, and those two had not been linked. And of course, once the questions are raised, there are always very bright people all over who will start to look for answers. And as we began to look for answers, we saw differences. And over the years, they really have been elaborated. We saw differences in preventive care. We saw differences in diagnosis, in therapy, in outcomes. And this is an area that is expanding by the year. As I mentioned in my uh, Mayo Grand Rounds lecture yesterday, uh, just in the past decade, there have been about a dozen position papers from the professional societies specifically addressing individual aspects of heart disease in women and identifying that there are major sex and gender differences. Now, uh, when we have basically achieved um, uh, the position that uh, most of the uh, professionals are recognizing that there is a difference in uh, not only cardiovascular, but other diseases between men and women. How do you see that field evolving from now? And uh, can you please comment, how do you see that interaction between women's health, women's health and sex differences? Well, These two yeah. terms are frequently yeah. used uh, uh, together, but um, I'm wondering, um, uh, uh, especially with respect to women's health, uh, how do we go uh, from well, here? It's interesting because previously women's health and women's health research decades ago were what I called bikini medicine. It related to the areas covered by the bikini bathing suit, the breasts and the reproductive system. And everything else was ignored. The diseases that were shared by women and men were not addressed at all in women. And I think this is where we're beginning to see the major difference. And of course, what we see now is that we've just begun to scratch the surface. The emphasis today is on personalized medicine, patient-centered care. Per every year has its own new buzz term. Mm -hmm. But once you begin to do personalization, the first cut is sex and gender. And then we do all of the other subsequent cuts until we get down to the genomics, metabolomics, etc. But the first cut is sex and gender. And I think we have to examine this in everything that we do to say, are there differences? And do the differences make a difference? In my own research field of uh, preeclampsia as a risk factor of cardiovascular uh, and renal disease future in, life, in, in future life, there is a lot of uh, most recent development, uh, most recent developments. How do you see um, uh, this field evolving uh, and um, how it can proactively be targeted. Uh. Oh, I, I think this is a very important area. In our prevention guidelines in 2011, we highlighted, I think for the first time in a guideline, <laughs> these were preventive guidelines for women, that a history of hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, hypertension of pregnancy, preeclampsia, eclampsia, preterm delivery, mm -hmm. small for gestational age babies, that all of these were markers of future cardiovascular risk. 
And we emphasize that in order to do an appropriate risk assessment in women, you had to have a detailed history of pregnancy complications. Now, over the years, as we've begun to acquire data, we see that it increases the risk of future hypertension, coronary disease, stroke, now emerging evidence of increased occurrence of heart failure, particularly heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. And we're beginning to look now for mechanisms. Mm -hmm. are, they, are they vascular mechanisms? Are they inflammatory mechanisms? Is there a combination? But I think that this tells us that there has to be a very close affiliation between the cardiologists and the OBGYN physicians. And just a few weeks ago, there was a joint statement from ACOG mm -hmm. and the American Heart Association uh, defining that the OBGYN physician is the primary care physician so for so many ostensibly healthy women and that these physicians have an obligation to do cardiovascular risk assessment in addition to the usual preventive work they do with mammography, uh, pap smears, and so forth. Yeah. It, it is critically important because I think there was, uh, uh, for a long time, there was an assumption that uh, pregnancy is a physiological event and therefore uh, everything that happens during pregnancy, even hypertension, is going to resolve after pregnancy. And now we are more and more aware that this is really a stress test that may unmask underlying metabolic and vascular problems that ultimately may declare themselves as a full-blown disease later in life. Well, we know. We, we were taught that preeclampsia subsides with the delivery yes. of the placenta. It's really a placental disease rather than otherwise. But we know it's not because there is residual vascular abnormalities, yeah. abnormal vascular reactivity, and more recently it has been associated with an increased occurrence of coronary artery calcium. And to me, coronary calcium is atherosclerosis. Yeah. So at our Women's Heart Center at Emory, we have one of our women uh, cardiologists who meets with the patients as they come for their six-week OBGYN checkup after their preeclamptic pregnancy. So they're introduced to the cardiologist, we look for risk factors, and then depending on what is found, uh, then they may transfer part of their care to cardiovascular care. But certainly the preventive aspects are emphasized right there and then. Uh, another thing that you really pioneered and um, really brought to the attention of other cardiologists is the early rehabilitation program. What led you to envision uh, rehabilita cardiac rehabilitation and particularly early rehabilitation as one of the means to prevent, uh, of secondary prevention? Well, you know, you have to remember that when I was in medical school and when I was in training, we had no specific therapies for acute myocardial infarction. Patient with acute myocardial infarction was put at strict bed rest and it was for two or three months they barely moved, and then probably for the next six months or so, they had very limited activity at home. They lost a year of their lives. And I was very interested in the physiology of exercise. And the basis for the strict bed rest was Schlesinger's pathology data that it took months to heal a myocardial infarction, but that came from the pathology laboratory. Those were the patients who died. We were seeing the patients who survived, and I didn't see any reason why that pathology had to be the same in the survivors as in the ones who died. And the question was, could we move these individuals safely around? And the late Dr. Sam Levine in Boston started putting the patients in a chair instead of at strict bed rest. And as I saw that, that worked beautifully. And when I started at Grady Memorial Hospital, we just had a coronary care unit, which meant that we had these patients hardwired to an ECG monitor. So I could see the rhythm and what we did. And we started an early ambulation in hospital. And uh, the uh, Emory, it started out as a 21-step program and then went down to 17 and then 14 steps. But the first day we allowed the patients to sit up. 
and we watched the monitor and nothing happened. And by the end of the first week, we were letting them stand and walk around the bed. And I must admit, when I presented our initial data, this incidentally went through an institutional review board. We had an IRB at Emory early, early on, because our dean was a clinical pharmacologist. And it got IRB approval, et cetera. And uh, our program was funded by the federal government, by the, by the rehabilitation group. And the questions at the meeting had nothing to do with the outcomes, with the data I presented. Everyone just wanted to know how much malpractice insurance I was carrying. <laughs> but we had no problem with this. And, then, and th this was the first early ambulation program in the world in a public hospital in the Deep South. And then we started an outpatient rehabilitation program. And uh, we started sending patients to rehab pretty early. There was no reason, I thought, why they should be sitting at home doing nothing and further deconditioning. Remember, we were getting all the deconditioning data coming out of the space program when the astronauts were weightless. Interesting. And it, it all fed together. And we, we had one of the earliest cardiac rehabilitation programs in the country. But it was, it was very exciting because for these patients, uh, if they were out of work for a year, they would never work in their lives again. So getting them up and out and back to work was absolutely critical for their well-being. So nowadays it's sort of uh, um, accepted that this is how we do that. I can only imagine uh, how was it at the times when it was considered that uh, uh, this is really uh, uh, contraindicated for somebody with uh, ischemic event. Well, we're doing something even uh, a bit more adventurous today because even though cardiac rehabilitation is a 1A recommendation in all of the clinical practice guidelines, probably only a third of eligible patients participate. And there are just a number of barriers in addition to finance and insurance and accessibility. And we have started to work with smartphone-based rehabilitation so that it can be done at home uh, with instructions, with or without access to monitoring devices, etc. And I think many other people are trying this. And if I were to look into my crystal ball and say, what do I think mm -hmm. cardiac rehabilitation is going to look like in the next decade? I think there will be much more home-based rehabilitation and much of it will be device-based. And this is one of the interests now in the uh, Million Hearts program, where a number of the projects are looking at home-based rehabilitation rather than center-based rehabilitation, and looking at devices as a way to deliver uh, rehabilitation at the convenience of the patient and to improve accessibility. So I think we're, we're trying some additional things that are very exciting. From our previous interactions, I know that you have uh, multiple interests within the uh, field of cardiology. What is the current interest? What are you working on right now? Well, I think my newer, although not newest, mm -hmm. newer interest is geriatric cardiology. Because just as early on, I saw very limited data for women. As I see patients in their 80s and 90s in the coronary care unit, in the cardiac catheterization laboratory, undergoing procedures, I realize that we have virtually no quality data for these patients. And we are going to have to get it. This is a burgeoning population, and we need specific data on the outcomes for these patients. But even more important, there are so many specific geriatric considerations. These patients don't have an infinite lifespan. So when we do an intervention, we have to think about time to benefit compared with the patient's anticipated longevity. We have to think of their multimorbidities. We have to think of the polypharmacy. But most important, what are, those, what are the individual patient's goals of care? Because some patients want everything to be done. Other patients just want to decrease symptoms. Others want to stay out of the hospital. So it, there has to be shared decision making that conform to the patient's goals of care. And that means that you have to adapt guideline-based yes. 
recommendations? Yeah, and uh, I, I think especially in the current area when even some major sort of um, associations have disagreement as to the treatment of elderly, like with hypertension guidelines that are, we, we, we won't go into <laughs> that uh, during this um, interview, but uh, I, I think that uh, uh, approach to hypertension, which is quite different based on the different guidelines, particularly for elderly, uh, uh, clearly demonstrates the importance of that issue as you're raising Well, it. the problem is, of course, that the elderly patients are probably a much more heterogeneous population than any other age segment. So I'm not sure you can say we're going to do this for all elderly patients. And I think the good clinician individualizes. Mm -hmm. And we, we've always said you measure blood pressure seated, and then you measure blood pressure standing, because you don't want to substitute perfect blood pressure control for hypotension and a broken mm -hmm. hip. Yes. So uh, you really have to individualize. Yeah. Especially, you know, given the, the, the difference between biological and chronological aging, which is uh, uh, maybe even more um, uh, unmasked and visible uh, among elderly. Well, the, the most exciting part is that we're beginning to get data specifically on geriatric syndromes, and people are interested in multimorbidity and polypharmacy and frailty and cognitive decline, mm -hmm. etc. And uh, they are being discussed at national meetings, and we're beginning to get some feel of how we're going to use this. There are validated measures that are not used as widely as they should be. Yeah, agree. Um, I, uh, through um, uh, interactions with you over the last several years, um, I am aware of multiple mentees that you had during your career. What is your approach to mentoring? And how is it important for overall progress of medicine? Well, I was very fortunate to have some superb mentors during my career. Uh, sadly, none of them were women until fairly recent years because uh, there were no women in our field in a position to mentor me. But the advice that I got, the guidance that I got, uh, the support that I got from the people who mentored me in medical school during my fellowship and residency training and then as a junior faculty member were just invaluable. And this is a give back mode so that I, th I benefited so much from the mentoring I received that I take every opportunity I can to mentor both women and men. and. Uh, mentoring is different for each individual and actually for each individual at different stages of the career. And it is a contract, if you will, between the mentor and the mentee uh, because it, the, the mentor has to be responsive as much as he or she can to what the mentee wants. I think you're trying to keep your mentee out of trouble, but that's uh, a minor part of it. It's mostly showing them potential ways in which they can enlarge their horizons, other people that might help them, other areas that they might want to visit, and uh, just asking enough questions to open up new vistas. Uh, Mentoring is very different with each mentor-mentee pa pair, uh, but I think it is an intrinsic component of what we do with trainees and with junior faculty. Um, uh, changing the subject a little bit, um, I am aware of your uh, work as the volunteer and giving back to community. Can you share with us uh, your perspective on these important aspects of a physician's life? Well, again, uh, by the fact that I went to college, that I went to medical school, that I was trained in prestigious institutions, I know when I was taught by my family that because I was privileged in this way, I have the responsibility to give back. Mm -hmm. So I've certainly done volunteer work through health professional organizations, but we're members of communities. So I'm involved uh, with my synagogue. 
I'm involved. I, I, both my husband and I are music lovers and opera lovers, and we've been involved with the uh, Atlanta Symphony Orchestra for over half a century. Uh, with the uh, opera when it came to Atlanta, Metropolitan Opera no longer has a traveling group, but we were very much involved with that. We are charter members of the Art Museum. I've been involved with a number of Jewish women's organizations. I've twice been president of Hadassah in Atlanta, and I currently serve as the honorary chair for the physicians uh, group uh, within Hadassah. So I've gone to Israel a couple of times in t doing work with and for Hadassah. And uh, I work with the Atlanta Jewish Federation again, mentoring young women in fundraising and community activities and so forth. So this is a very important part of my life, and I thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, but I expect that we all have a responsibility to give back. And the older I get, the more I feel I have the responsibility to give back more and more, and to train the younger women who are going to follow me in my path. So uh, just on, at the per on the personal level, how did you find energy, motivation, time to be a mother, professional, um, uh, 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 activist, volunteer, uh, impeccable scientist? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's a passion for what you do. And obviously, my first and most cherished obligation was to my family, to my wonderful husband and three daughters. Uh, but I think that by what I did in my professional life and in my volunteer life, I've seen it reflected in my daughters who have gone on to become very successful professional women, but who are very active in their communities as well. So uh, I think it was leading by example. And again, in my organizational life within medicine, uh, I have been very active in the professional organizations and uh, have seen the development of women's groups within the American Heart Association, within the American College of Cardiology, and more recently, geriatric cardiology groups. And I was one of the founders of the American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation decades ago. And that's an organization that is thriving. So I think that when you see the things that you invested in grow and be enormously successful, it just is a stimulus to do more. Um, uh, when you started your uh, medical school, were you expecting to have such a fascinating career uh, that is really so influential in changing um, uh, uh, dogmas, in uh, uh, breaking the, um, uh, going through the, um, uh, breaking the ceiling? Well, again, I never really thought about the challenge of women in medicine. I applied to medical school. I was accepted. Uh, I went through some of the best training programs in the country, and. Fortunately, I was exposed to very many superiors who were gender blind. And because of that, I think my emphasis was on being a good cardiologist. Not a good woman cardiologist, but a good cardiologist. Mm -hmm. But because I had managed to succeed, I thought it was my responsibility to help other women succeed. This is absolutely fascinating. Uh, uh, is there uh, an, any other thoughts, any other reflections that you would uh, like to share with our viewers? Well, again, when I give grand rounds and look at the auditorium and see that almost half of the attendees, the medical students, the residents, the advanced trainees, all women, uh, I am just delighted. What I think we have to see is more women in senior positions. I think we have to see more women on boards of directors. I think we have to see more women uh, as leaders of companies, as leaders of hospital systems. Uh, 
but I expect that each year we are doing better and better in making the women feel part of the profession. And the most delightful thing is that the delineation, lady doctor, which was the way I was called when I started out at Grady. They knew, everyone knew who Lady Doctor was because there were only one or two of us. <laughs> now that designation would be ridiculous because it would refer to about half of the population. So I expect that we have made major steps on the journey, but we're not there yet. Thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for the, your reflections and insights and perspectives how uh, both um, women in medicine and medicine about women should further develop. Thank you very much for the interview. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.